my worst ever rental property story and what I would do differently. I once had a rental property that was so bad, I almost quit doing rentals. And I love rentals, especially now that I've had them for so many years. So let me tell you what happened and how you can avoid what happened to me and not make that same mistake. Early on in my real estate career, I knew I wanted to have rental properties. And so I tried to follow in the footsteps of my father who bought some duplexes, threeplexes, fourplexes. As a matter of fact, my very first purchase when I was 21 years old was a duplex that we turned into a threeplex. That's a story all in itself where I had to put stairs in and take stairs out and mess around with all that and figure out parking. I didn't realize at that time that there's like zoning codes and there's violations and the city wants to tell you what to do even though it's your own property. I just kind of thought, well, just do what you want, it's yours. It doesn't quite work that way in my naive 21 year old mind. What I learned really quickly, um, well, not really quickly, over five years is I actually don't like plexes. One of the reasons I don't like plexes is because you can have tenants on top of each other. They can be fighting with each other. There's noise concerns. They can be mad at each other. They can have a fight, those types of things. Now, I fully get why people like plexes. I get the concept of them saying, you know, it's kind of nice to have, never have one property vacant. But what I didn't like is the management hassle of dealing with it. Now, I can also tell you when people are getting started in rental properties, they overlook the amount of management that is necessary. So lots of times they just look simply at cash flow. And what you'll find is some of the more difficult properties have a higher cap rate, which is the rate of return you're getting on the property if there is not a loan in place. But you may have a whole lot of management and you may have a whole lot of repairs that are necessary. So some of the best cash flowing properties really don't cash flow that much by the time you take out management and by the time you take out repairs, by the time you take out some vacancy, you're dealing with that. So I have decided and I call those C-class properties or D-class properties. So I look at all properties, A-class properties are um, like the best B-class properties or second C and then D-class properties. And there's A plus, A minus, you know, that type of stuff. Now, commercial properties, properties do everything based upon this A, B, C, or D. And they say, hey, this is an A plus, a B minus, a C plus, whatever the case is. And this depends on age. It depends on location. Um, it depends on um, vacancy. It's going to depend on the uh, how much work, if it's been remodeled or not done, that type of stuff. And you'll classify these. Well, these are the same types of ways I like to classify single family houses or duplexes, A, B, C, or D. What I find is most new investors are working in that C and and D realm. And the reason is, is because when they put a pencil to it, they're like, man, I can get an 8% return or cap rate where on these, I'm only getting a 6% return or a 5% return. Um, maybe this is five and this is six, you know, something like that. And I'm going to get an eight or maybe a 9% return on these properties. Uh, now I'm using all this for example purposes. So what tends to happen is new real estate investors come and say, you know, I should buy this property. But what they forget about is the management and the nightmares that go along with that. So to give you an example, I bought a fourplex. I had four people in there. We did the remodel. We put people in there and it had a great cap rate or so it seemed. And I get a call in the middle of the night that the police are there and somebody uh, pulled out a gun and shot at somebody. Now, luckily no one died. Nobody got injured, but I don't like those phone calls in the middle of the night. That's not the type of areas I want to be, be in. So one of the things I changed in my policy and procedures when I'm dealing with rental properties is what number one rule for me is I only want to invest where I would allow my wife or daughter to walk down the street at night alone. If the property doesn't qualify for that, I'm not interested. Now, there are a lot of investors that make a lot of money in those types of neighborhoods. That's just not what I want to deal with because I value my time too much and I value a good night's sleep too much. I don't want middle of the night phone calls. I don't want to have to be dealing with stuff all the time. And you may say, well, I'll just hire a property manager to do that. Property managers don't get paid enough to do it. It's just not enough money in it. If you think about it, on a property manager, if the property manager, if, if it's $1,000 a month rent and they're going to charge you 7 to 10%, they're making 70 to to $100 a month. So for the whole year, they're making at most, you know, $1,000 to $1,200, okay? That's at most what they're making. Now, they may get half a month's rent if they lease the property, but the thing I don't like that, or a full month's rent, $1,000, I don't like that because guess what? He's going to make as much to relist the property 
property as he is to manage the property for the entire year. So what does that motivate the, the uh, manager to do? He'd rather turn, he'd rather churn your rental property because he's gonna get paid more on that than he is on this and it's over, it's faster. If he puts a new tenant in there, you owe him a thousand bucks where he would have gotten a hundred dollars a month, but you don't wanna be putting new tenants in there. That's the problem. You want tenants to stay as long as possible. And so I don't like having the plexus because I found they're typically not as great neighborhoods. They're typically have problems with tenants. And lastly, they're pretty transient. Most people in the plexus are only staying there for six months, eight months, seven months, whatever the case is. That made me fall in love with single family houses. Single family houses, I find I can move people in there. They're typically families and my average tenant stays for five years. Now there's a reason that they stay for five years and it is because I take great care of them. So for example, if the home, if the market says this should rent at a thousand dollars, you know, and that's, I've got comparables and I look at that. I'm going to rent it for 900 to 950. I am going to rent it for 50 to a hundred dollars less less than what market is. And you're gonna say, Ryan, you're, you're crazy. You're losing money. You're doing this stuff. I'm like, oh no, I'm not. Look and see how this works. So the average tenant's gonna turn over about every year. And if it's in a, a duplex, fourplex, it's gonna be about every six months. The problem with that, when you have tenant turnover, you're gonna have vacancy. And it's typically gonna be for two months, right? You're gonna have repairs. You're gonna have to do carpet clean and all that type of stuff. Um, so you're gonna have lost rent, which is gonna be, let's just call this $2,000 of lost rent. And let's say you're gonna pay another $1,000 um, in repairs, that's $3,000 that you're gonna have. Now, if that happens every single year, that's gonna be $15,000 you're gonna have every year for five years if you've got tenant turnover. Well, guess what? I am underwriting my property by 50 or $100 per month, and I'm doing that for five years. It's basically, let's just call it $100 or $1,000 a year. I have over five years. I'm basically out $5,000, but I save myself from $15,000, so I made an additional $10,000 if I can keep that tenant in. Now, I'm still gonna be raising prices though, right? So as the market raises, as things change in the market, I'm gonna be bumping prices, but I always wanna be 50 to $100 less than what the market is, because I wanna incentivize good people to stay there for a very long time. Not only does it put $10,000 more in my pocket in this you know, example for, for example purposes, but it also puts a lot of stress off of my life because I don't have to deal with finding new people. I don't have to deal with managers. I don't have to deal with all those things. I've got the same person in there. And if I do it right, they're taking great care of my property. Now you're probably saying, Ryan, you told me you had this horrible experience that made you want to stop doing rental properties. Well, it all comes down to one thing. We had a property that we purchased. We actually purchased the property from HUD and we bought the property and turned it into a rental property. We did a bunch of repairs to the property. We put a tenant in there. This was earlier on in my career and um, we were desperate. We were desperate to get a tenant in there because we were worried about that mortgage payment every single month. Now I can tell you, my new philosophy is I would rather not get paid than get paid by the wrong person. That's my philosophy. Don't get paid rather than getting paid by the wrong person. Because if you're anxious and you're trying to just shove anybody into the rental property, that's where you're gonna get yourself in trouble. And that's a lot more costly than waiting. And I'll show you why. Because a few years later, we went and took a look at the property because they moved out in the middle of the night. Well, what we found was some things that concerned us and we found some things that made us worry that there may be methamphetamines um, that they were cooking or using or smoking on the property. So we got a meth test done and sure enough, it came back positive. Now, the worst part of this is where it had the most concentration of meth was in the baby's room. There was a, a crib and that type of stuff and it had the highest concentration in this poor little kid's room. Um, a, a baby, it's horrible. So we had to do a full meth remediation, which means you've got to tear out the carpets, you've got to spray uh, the exteriors, you've got to turn out the pad, you've got to put new carpet pad in there, you've got to uh, do all these crazy things and it cost us over $30,000 to do that. $30,000. That's where I said to myself, you know what? Why are we doing this? This is really crazy. And I can tell you early on in your rental property career where you're trying to build cash flow, that's gonna happen where you're gonna say, why are we doing this? But if you fast forward 10 years or 20 years, you're gonna say, oh my goodness, this was worth everything we have ever done. I ended up fixing the property up and I just sold the property because I was so frustrated with it. It's also a thing where I don't know if that property was the best location. I would say that's more of a C-class property. Um, and now I, I'm in the B-class properties. Here's the thing. The a 
A-class properties are too expensive and I don't like the cash flow or the cap rates that I'm getting on those. The C and D-class properties have better cash flow. However, if you've taken into consideration vacancies and repairs, I think it's worse. So I like to play in the B-class properties. That's what I'm looking for. Um, those are the types of areas that I wanna be in. Those are the types of properties that I think are the very best. But the lesson to be learned here is that when you're dealing with these things, don't be quick to put a tenant in the property. You wanna put the right tenant in the property. So the way that I look at this is a job interview. I look at this, if the property's worth $250,000, I am looking at the person and saying, I'm gonna give you $250,000 to take care of. And it's in the form of this house. How good of a job is this person going to do taking care of my $250,000? Are they gonna make it worse? Are they gonna make it better? Are they gonna take good care of it? And if I can't answer those questions honestly, I'm not gonna rent to that person because that's what I'm looking for. I am looking to hire someone to be a steward of my asset. I am not looking for a renter. I am looking for someone that's gonna take care of my property and improve it and make it better. That's what I'm looking for. I am not looking for a tenant. How do I attract people like that? Well, quite easily, I have lower rents. My rents are 50 to $100 less than market rents, which then keeps the right people in there for a long period of time and they want to stay. That's how this works works out and the things that I've done that have saved my bacon time and time again. So don't get desperate. You would rather have no one paying rent than the wrong person paying rent because it can come back and bite you later and cost you an absolute lots of money. Now I can tell you, since I've made these changes, I have not had to evict somebody in a situation like this. I have ha not had to deal with that, but it all starts, the whole key to this is having the right property and having the right tenant. And you're wanting to find somebody that's gonna take care of your asset. Think of it as a job interview. They are interviewing to see if they would be a good person to take care of your property. Property. That's what you're looking for when you're looking for a tenant and you want to find the right tenant. That is what it's all about. I have put together a video you're going to want to watch next. It's why hard money is the backbone on fix and flip funding. Why hard money funding comes before finding a property. Why every deal should start with finding a hard money loan and things you need to look for. Check it out. I'll put it on the screen and also in the description below. You're going to want to watch this video. Otherwise, make it a profitable day and bye for now.